The Tinder Swindler. Part 1. Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor. Most of you will now be familiar with the story of the Tinder Swindler and the victims that he has defrauded. I am going to provide you with an analysis of his behaviour as demonstrated throughout the film that appears on Netflix, The, Twind the Tinder Swindler. I will then provide a conclusion as to what he is. I will explain why the victims were conned. And I'll also explain to you what each of the primary victims are in terms of the classification system that I use. It is just as important to understand who they are with regard to who he is. And the dynamic between those individuals. The determination that's made is based upon the information that has been put forward. As I explain on many occasions, there are those that come to me and say, HG, this person did that, does that mean they're a narcissist? At best, one can say it's an indicator, but one can never say that one action of itself is determinative. What we must do is look at a range of material over a sustained period of time. And to then look at that to an evidential standard for the purpose of making a determination as to what this person is. Are we dealing with a normal person? Is this person a narcissist? Are they narcissistic or are they an empath? And if they are a narcissist or an empath, what type are they? in accordance with the classification system that I use by virtue of school, subschool, and cadre. It's important to understand that we don't have the Tinder swindler's full side of the story, but we do have large sections of it, as evidenced by his own messages, his own sound files, his own pictures, and his own videos. We also have reportage that has come from other places with regard to his behaviour. There is a slew of victim testimony about his behaviour which is largely corroborative and therefore would be viewed as credible. There are three victims reported on in the film and of course there are others in the background, for instance his Finnish victims and others besides that get a passing mention at a particular point. There are, of course, many other victims who don't feature in the film and we don't have the full detail at all of the circumstances of what they experienced. Remember, the film that you may well have watched, or that you may now watch, has been edited to heighten dramatic effect and we're not going to get the full anatomy of the relationship. For example, the Dutch national Eileen Charlotte's seduction is not really provided in detail. Undoubtedly, those that made the film thought that the seduction information that was provided with regard to Cecile, the Norwegian, and Penilla, the Swede, dealt with that aspect, and therefore it would be viewed as duplication of effort to go into it in considerable detail. Of course, we don't get much about her seduction or the potential embedding of her in a relationship, yet she appears to have had the longest relationship of the three at 14 months. What I'm going to do is go through the film. It won't appear, obviously, on your screen for copyright reasons. But I'm going to follow the narrative of the film and explain what all of the words spoken and actions seem to note with regard to behaviour and potential narcissistic or empathic indicators. I'm going to follow the film thread so that you can easily re-watch it and link it to what you've heard me explain, or the other way around. As you listen to me, you can recall segments of the film and therefore link it easily.
with the analysis. Accordingly, make yourself comfortable. And let us now analyse the Tinder swindler. In the introduction to the film, we see, of course, that this individual uses Tinder as a means to ensnare women. Tinder is a dating app and is a hunting ground. And if you haven't listened to it already, you really ought to pay attention to my video why you should not use online dating. The Tinder swindler makes heavy use of Tinder. He also makes heavy use of Instagram. Instagram and, and other social media, of course, are the playthings of a narcissist and engage in many things such as showmanship, grandiosity, triangulation, hoovering, relationship bulletins, and so forth. We see that there is extensive use of the telephone. That is an indicator. Many narcissists have the phone as a headquarters, as an operations HQ. It allows so much activity to be undertaken, hunting on dating sites, hoovering people through text messages and voice messages, receiving calls, extending reach, manipulating individuals through the use of the phone itself or by triangulation with it. We see in the introduction that the Tinder swindler makes heavy use of private jets, the attendance at cool parties, riding in expensive cars, wearing expensive clothing, there are the watches, the expensive dinners, he stays in lavish hotels and so forth. And this demonstrates the narcissistic traits of vanity and pride. It exhibits showmanship, grandiosity, and, in instances, it appears to show generosity, which is financial largesse. On his Instagram profile, we see that he has 103,000 followers. Not the largest in the world, but certainly no small beer. And there are lots of pictures showing the trappings of apparent success, the expensive cars, him kissing an animal, parties, exotic locations, and so forth. This is demonstrated to create a facade, a facade of success and superiority. The film explains to us that he matches with a Norwegian lady who is based in London called Cecilia. And as soon as she matches with him, there is a near immediate response from him, as it looks like he hoovers her, hoovers her from the off. He hoovers her with the message, Hi, I'm leaving London tomorrow. Do you want to meet up? It's benign, it's friendly, but this is threat and loss and promised gain. Namely, I'm putting a deadline on my first interaction with you, which exhibits a sense of entitlement. It's not, hello, how are you? Or, what are you up to today? But it's immediately, I'm leaving London tomorrow, do you want to meet up? Basically saying, here's a chance, or you're going to lose me. Of course, there will be those that would respond to that by saying, not able to do, but thanks, maybe we catch one another another time. But in this instance, the huck that has been placed in the dating waters finds an appropriate victim. And there is agreement from Cecilia to meet. Note that he very quickly wants to meet up with her. There is no exchange of messages, no perhaps conversation first, but it's straight to the meet. A narcissist that engages in that is looking to assert control through physical presence rather than through electronic communication and is often an indicator of an online somatic narcissist. They want to get to you in the flesh rather than continue the badinage through the electronic realm. He meets her quickly and shows immediately also that he has a job apparently as the CEO of LLD Diamonds. This, of course, we know is a lie. It's showmanship on his part, and he's triangulating her with this apparent position for the purpose of asserting control and to try and impress her. He describes himself as the Prince of Diamonds, a lie and grandiosity. Cecile recounts that very quickly he's very personal. That exhibits poor boundary recognition by him. He mentions that he has a baby daughter, but he's not with the mother. This is triangulation. He states, I want to get to know you better do you want to come to Bulgaria? So straight out of the traps following the meet, it's let's meet up, and then I'm now going to Bulgaria, do you want to come? 
Notice again the use of threat and loss and promise gain. You've got a decision to make. Chop, chop, chop. Are you going to come or not? You might lose out. Already she's met this individual that has shown an interest in her. Already he has impressed her in terms of the way that he dresses. She comments about the fact that, uh, that she likes the, the fact that he's wearing a suit and he's smartly presented. He gives the trappings of success by making reference, although it's a lie, to this job working at LLD Diamonds. And therefore, it looks like there are many things to like about this individual. He appears interested in her. He appears thoughtful. He listened to her as she spoke. He also appears to be successful, having money. He therefore arranges for his driver to take Cecilia home so that she can pack and get her passport. This is a benign assertion of control by false caring. And it is done, of course, to ensure that she doesn't have second thoughts and wriggles off the hook. Instead, it looks like he cares about her, but he's actually controlling her by ensuring that she's driven to the house. She then sees that he has a driver, a bodyguard, and there's also another individual there with a child. And it would appear that this is his child, and this is the mother of the child, a former romantic partner of Simon. This is the first date that they are in effect on, and as a consequence of this, what actually happens is that he is showing a lack of boundary recognition, and he's triangulating her with the mother of his child, by having them all together. It transpires that he sleeps with Cecilia on the first night, exhibiting a sense of entitlement. She notices that he has marks on his back, and he explains that there is a consequence of the, him being manhandled in prison in South Africa because he was Jewish. We don't know whether this is the truth or not, and it may well be a lie, and the marks have come from somewhere else, and therefore it's a lie and a pity play. Alternatively, if he is telling the truth, it's a pity play. We might have a revision of history at work. He continues his love bombing of Cecilia, and those of you will be familiar that certain narcissists engage in this behaviour, a blitzkrieg assault on you to bring you under control and draw fuel from you, two of the prime aims. There are a lot of calls on the phone. And he then says to her, We're so busy, I think it's best if you go home. In effect, he's given her a taste of what he has. He's given her a taste of the fact that there is a swish car, a fancy hotel that they stayed in, that he travelled by private jet, that he seems to be a decent man who is still supporting his child and his former partner which has been confirmed to Cecilia by this individual. However, he explains to her that it's now time for her to go because he's so busy. It's likely that this is being done in that moment for the purposes of asserting control over her by moving her away because there's somebody else coming onto his radar. But it also has the effect of causing her to have a taste of the of what Simon can offer, but then to snatch it away from her, leaving her wanting more. This is an early control test to determine how under control she is coming. Is she being sucked in and absorbed, or is she not that interested? And Therefore, it needs to be a follow-up on that to ascertain how she reacts to the fact that she was popped back on the shelf fairly quickly. He sends a number of voice messages, which are, of course, Hoover's. He says that he wants her to be his girlfriend. Early move to that, and rather swift, which is indicative of the narcissistic need to assert control. He explains that he wants to be open and honest with her. And he makes it seem as if that she's a confidant. When he leaves the voice messages, it's noteworthy that they always have a flat effect and there is no emotion. In part, this may be because he speaks English with a heavily accented voice because he's Israeli. But, as you'll find in future parts, he is capable of denoting emotion when he leaves a message, but the flat effect here is telling. It demonstrates that what he's actually saying, that there are no emotions backing the words, and more importantly, 
that he's not capable of mimicking those emotions for the purpose of making it seem genuine. Of course, bearing in mind that both of them aren't native English speakers, the absence of such emotion would likely be put down to the fact that they're both speaking a second language. But the fact is, to an expert here such as mine, it's clear that there is a flat effect in the way that he talks, and that denotes the absence of the emotion that should be supporting what he's talking about. Simon explains that he needs to get a deal done, and it's a $70 million deal. What he then does is introduce the concept that he is a man who faces considerable pressure. He talks about there being threats, bullets being received in the mail, receiving a funeral wreath, and that there was an apparent break-in at his apartment. All of this is a pity play and triangulation to create the impression with Cecilia that what he does is rather dangerous, and he has enemies. He then shelves Cecilia. She hears nothing, and undoubtedly he would be busy interacting with somebody else at this juncture. She is off the radar. Also, as part of this shelving, the narcissism has actively sought to test her interest in him, to determine, is she still on the hook? And indeed, the early test indicates that she is, because after hearing nothing from him, she contacts him after seeing that he's been active on Tinder. He replies to this, where she's asking about him to assert control with a hoover, by stating that we're a team. And he then states in a voicemail message, I deleted the app, I deleted the account, I care about you, and I miss you. He hoovers again, but the flat effect in his voice is notable. At this juncture, he has got Cecilia on the hook. He's already slept with her, and she would be afforded the status of intimate partner secondary sources of shelf variety. Although he talks about wanting her to be the girlfriend, promise gain, they are not boyfriend and girlfriend, and instead he drew her in very quickly, love bombed her, and then placed her on the shelf, and then moved on with something else until she exhibited that she remained interested in him, thus signalling unconsciously that she is under control to an extent. Therefore he responds to that, almost like the owner of a dog giving it a chocolate treat, or a biscuit treat, by saying, good dog, you've come back to me, I'll pat you on the head and tell you that you are a good dog, and provide you with some kind of treat. And therefore, Cecilia was placed on the shelf, has exhibited that she's under control, and when she responds, demonstrating that, she's praised for it. So, our first victim has started to be drawn into the world of Simon Levive. But where will it lead to next? And what about the second victim who is on the horizon? Join me in part two.